Good morning, my friends. It's good to see you. And as always, thank you for having me back. I got here a little bit late because um, I'd forgotten about summer hours. So, uh, well, but, but I'm here and I'm, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, we will um, begin with um, reading of uh, Psalm 86, a prayer of David. Hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, Lord. Listen to my cry for mercy. When I am in distress, I call to you because you answer me. Among the gods, there is none like you, Lord. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, Lord. They will bring glory to your name, for you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Turn to me and have mercy on me. Show your strength in behalf of your servant. Save me because I serve you just as my mother did. Give me a sign of your goodness that, that my enemies may see it and be put to shame. For you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. One of my favorite books in the Bible is Genesis. But it can also be kind of unnerving at times. Once, once we get back past the fantastic tales of talking snakes and crowding the entire animal kingdom into an ark, we encounter some of the most vividly drawn, realistic, and multifaceted characters in all of world literature. These are not flat, one-dimensional characters whose stories illustrate trite, dime-store platitudes. No, they're complicated people, caught up in complicated relationships, which I guess is just another way of saying that they're like us, often painfully so. As we read the book of Genesis, we quickly find ourselves in the middle of a gripping intergenerational drama that centers around a promise made by God to the primordial ancestors of the Jewish nation, Abraham and Sarah. And by drama, I mean drama. The passage that Marty read to us a few minutes ago from Genesis recounts a moment when a long brewing conflict within the household of Abraham and Sarah finally came to a head with the calamitous outcome for one of Abraham's children. Like any family drama, the story of this conflict can be told from multiple perspectives. Indeed, there are as many perspectives as there are members of this fractured household. And every one of them can, with some justification, portray him or herself as the chief victim of all of the injustices committed by the others. But first, a little background. When we first meet Abraham and Sarah in Genesis, they are an elderly childless couple living somewhere in present day Iraq. One day, Abraham receives a set of instructions from God. Go from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. 
Abraham is promised that he will be the father of a great nation through which God will bless all of the other nations of the world. Abraham's name has become synonymous with obedience and trust in God because upon hearing this command, he immediately pulls up stakes and relocates his entire household, be himself, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, and all of the employees of what I imagine was a rather large ranching operation to the land of Canaan. Abraham was 75 years old when he received this call. Sarah was 65. So his confidence in God's ability to keep this promise of progeny, of offspring, is indeed a sign of the magnitude of his faith. But a decade passes and Abraham and Sarah remain childless. There wasn't much evidence that God was going to fulfill his promise any day soon, so Sarah decides to take the initiative. She has a young Egyptian servant named Hagar, whom we can assume was quite attractive. In an extraordinary act of compassion, Sarah tells her husband to take her attractive young servant as a mistress and conceive a child with her, since the aged Sarah seems unable to give Abraham the offspring that God had promised. Like a good husband, Abraham obeys his wife, and as the Bible delicately puts it, he goes into Hagar and conceives a child who will be named Ishmael. Problem solved. Everyone lives happily ever after. I mean, seriously, what could go wrong? Of course, everything quickly goes south, as anyone who knows anything about families could have readily predicted. One thing's for sure, though. If we were to interview each of the parties involved, maybe seat, seat them across from each other, say, on the Jerry Springer show, we would certainly hear three different accounts of what happened next. And we can be pretty sure that those accounts would all involve some finger pointing, but all in different directions. Well, Genesis gives us Sarah's account. We're told that one day, while Hagar was still pregnant, Sarah confronted Abraham in his tent and unloaded on him about all of the indignities she had suffered from her Egyptian servant ever since the day that Abraham went into her. According to Sarah, from the moment Hagar knew she was pregnant, she looked upon Sarah with contempt. It was as though this lowly slave had been taking every opportunity to rub Sarah's nose in the fact that she had given Abraham what Sarah could not. May the wrong done to me be upon you, Sarah yells at her poor husband, who was no, no doubt perplexed as to why he was being blamed. Was it fair to blame Abraham? Uh, viewing the situation from his point of view, no, not at all. After all, he was just doing what Sarah had asked of him. He was just obeying his wife when he made Hagar pregnant. And if the girl had gotten haughty just because she was carrying Abraham's child in her belly, well, whose fault was that? Certainly not his. So he says to his wife, in effect, this sounds like a you problem. You take care of it and leave me out of it. And he's kind of right. Since it's not like he had been actively encouraging Hagar to disrespect Sarah. But in a marriage, sometimes there are more important things than being right. Sarah is quite obviously in pain, understandably so. 
Perhaps she does feel that Abraham has somehow been encouraging Hagar's haughtiness. Maybe through some little kindness he had recently bestowed on the woman who bears his child. Maybe because of some attention he had been giving her recently. His defensive reaction to her attempt to saddle him with blame is understandable. But perhaps things might have gone differently if instead of if he had responded to her pain instead of her words, offering her the reassurance that she clearly needed at that moment. But instead, he tells her to deal with Hagar himself. However she sees fit, just leave me out of it. Unsurprisingly, Sarah elects to deal with Hagar rather harshly, making her pay not only for her own uppityness, but no doubt also for Abraham's indifference. Her mistreatment of Hagar was so severe that this young, pregnant woman fled into the wilderness to get away from the abuse. Well, so far, we've only heard from Sarah and Abraham. But what might this sordid Springer-esque drama look like from Hagar's perspective? Was Sarah's complaint against her really just? Hagar might remind us that she never asked to be drawn into this family, family imbroglio. It's not like she seduced Abraham. It was Sarah's idea for her husband to go into Hagar, who dutifully did what was asked of her and conceived a child for the elderly couple. And now, now, as soon as Hagar is pregnant, Sarah complains that she's acting arrogantly. Well, like many women upon learning that they're with child, Hagar, Hagar may just be feeling excited, pleased with herself, delighted with the new life growing within her. Could Sarah be mistaking for arrogance what is in fact just the happiness of a pregnant woman? Is it possible that Sarah's own insecurities are causing her to imagine things? Is it possible? It does seem possible. But on the other hand, is Hagar completely blameless? Unlike Sarah, Hagar is young and vibrant, and she knows it. She knows of Sarah's misfortune, too, which is the reason that she, Hagar, became pregnant in the first place. Could she have done more to console her childless mistress? Might the story have taken a different turn if she had? In any case, Hagar flees from Sarah's abusive treatment into the desert. Resting by a spring, she encounters an angel who orders her return to your mistress and submit to her authority. That may not strike us as the best solution, but perhaps it's better than poor pregnant Hagar having to fend for herself in the inhospitable desert, where she would be at the mercy of both the elements and any predatory human beings who might find her. But the angel also comforts her with the information that God has heard her affliction, and that through Ishmael, the child in her belly, she will have many descendants. So she returns, and we hear no more complaints about her from Sarah until this morning's passage. Perhaps that's because Hagar started watching her step, tiptoeing around her volatile mistress. Or perhaps it's, perhaps it's because Sarah's jealousy has um, tampered off over time. Or maybe... Abraham started paying more attention to his wife so that Sarah feels less cause for jealousy. But if peace reigns in the household, it is, alas, only a temporary peace. Well, 
In the meantime, Sarah, now pushing 90, by the way, miraculously does give birth to a child of her own, a son named Isaac. This is about 25 years after God, God first made that promise to Abraham. And so this morning's passage, the passage that Marty read for us a few minutes ago, it, it opens on a joyful celebration. Isaac has just been weaned, which makes him about two years old. He has survived infancy, which was always a cause for celebration in the ancient world. So a banquet was held to mark the occasion. If only our morning's passage ended at this point, we could draw the happy moral that all's well that ends well, and we could leave on that upbeat note. But stories in Genesis are just a little too committed to an accurate depiction of the human condition to let us off that easily. We're told that Sarah witnessed something that caused her to insist that Abraham send Hagar and Ishmael away. But what exactly did she see? Well, according to the NIV translation, which we're using this morning, she saw Ishmael mocking Isaac. But the word translated here as mocking has, has a wide range of meanings, one of which is simply to laugh. So in other translations, you'll read she saw Ishmael laughing with Isaac or playing with Isaac. So it could be that young Ishmael was simply laughing with joy, celebrating the life of his half-brother with all those gathered on that day. Did Sarah interpret a laugh of delight as something sinister? Once again, projecting her anxieties onto others? We don't know, but we do know what happened next. Sarah says to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance of my son, Isaac. Her son, Isaac, has a name. That woman's son does not. Abraham is in a horrible situation. The wife he loves is asking him to cast out the son he loves. The son he had with Hagar at Sarah's own request. Caught in an impossible situation, Abraham seeks guidance from God, who tells him to send Hagar and her son away. Well, why would God command such a thing? Well, it's likely that God recognized what should be equally apparent to all of us by now. This family is fractured beyond repair. But it didn't have to be that way. Everyone involved surely sees him or herself as a victim with some justification. But at the same time, each one of them has contributed in some way to bringing about this tragic situation in which brother is torn from brother and father from son. Of course, we learn that God had not forgotten Hagar and Ishmael, that he sought, sought to their needs in the desert and enabled Ishmael to grow into the strong, a strong man who would have probably made his father proud assuming fate had granted them the chance to meet again before Abraham died. But the fact that God was able to make the best of a horrible situation doesn't make it any less horrible. The title of my sermon is The Discarded Child, which, of course, refers to the one party to this sordid affair who really is an innocent victim. Young Ishmael, 
He was born into this mess. The mess that the adults in his life created while they were so busy justifying themselves. We don't know whether Abraham ever saw his son Ishmael again. But we're told that when he died, his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, came together to bury their father. Commenting on this passage, the great Jewish writer Elie Wiesel remarks, death often resolves the most difficult problems. In the face of death, most conflicts look childish. Perhaps we should take a look at some of the conflicts in which we're presently embroiled and see how childish they might be. Perhaps we should try to resolve them while there is still time. And perhaps we should be mindful that we might be creating innocent victims while we're so busy trying to justify ourselves. <laughs>